Welcome back to another episode of the Budget Overland Podcast. I'm your host, Benji, and today's episode's fun. I've got a friend of mine, Jared Hudson, on from Steadfast Overland. If you've not heard of Steadfast Overland, you've been living under a rock or you're soon to be aware of what he is. So before we get into any of that, I got some housekeeping things that you guys love to hear because that's uh, that's primarily 90% of the Overland Shenanigans show. But without further ado, we've got more expo coming up April 18th and 19th, or actually the April 19th and 20th, my bad, of April 2024. If you've never been to a more expo, you need to Google it. You need to go on YouTube. You need to watch these videos, and you'll have a really good understanding of what it is. But you're never going to truly understand until you go to one. And what's cool, each year it gets bigger and bigger. And you can camp there. You can do the S'more to More rally. You guys can go down to um, the Ozarks, down at Glade Top. You can go wherever you want and uh, just hang out and see all the cool new gear out on the uh, that's available for us Overlanders and uh, Weekend Warriors. Don't forget to use code BUDGETOVER10 to save 10% off your purchase on your tickets or anything that you buy through moreexpo.com budget over one zero and then don't forget to call the budget overland hotline guys we had four voicemails this past monday and that made it an absolute blast i had a couple people message me and just said you know it was a really fun show to listen to if you want to be a part of that call toll free 314-266-9536 leave me a voicemail ask me a question say hello tell me what's going on in your overland world i'd love to hear from you and uh, tell us what's going on um, that's kind of relative to your area. I know, like, I'm in the Midwest. I hear a lot of things going on here and there. I know the West Coast, they've got a lot of these trail closure things happening. The East Coast, they've got a giant south, was it, sweep up the southeast or something like that event coming up here in December 2nd. Um, so if you're not familiar with all these things going on in the world, tune in on Mondays for Overland Shenanigans. And then lastly, don't forget, guys, we're going to do a listener camp out with Lady Overlander Radio and Professor Bats and Friends the second weekend of December. And here's the fun thing. We're not going to blast it all over social media. It's just going to be for the listeners only. Um, I've kind of kind of already dropped a couple clues this week. Um, I will say it's near water. Um, it's in Arkansas. And it's accessible with uh, two-wheel drive vehicles. So those are about three little hints there. Uh, we're going to start getting more specific here in the next couple weeks as we get closer. We're going to start dropping some pins and, and fun little things that you guys can follow along. It's toll free. All you got to do is show up. If you can find us, you can camp with us. That's that's the rules. And, uh, yeah, you can share with your friends, I guess, but we're just not going to blast it all over the social medias. That was a mouthful. Jared, are you still there? Oh, yeah, right here. Good. I didn't put you to sleep. Uh, not yet and and we won't say about our earlier mishap um uh, we won't even bring that up so no <laughs> <laughs> without further ado we got jared with steadfast overland how the heck are you brother well i'm good doing good so uh, me and you've been talking for a minute now uh i don't we've still never camped together which i'm super bummed out no uh, but we're, like every, we're gonna make every, it happen yeah every time it's <laughs> like something's going on I, my life is kind of busy and all over the place and, you know, you got, yeah. I have two daughters that are in college, so it gets busy, you know. I thought it was going to be less busy. It's just as busy. <laughs> as soon as they left the house? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's the same. That's funny, man. So, uh, so Steadfast Overland, tell everyone out there, how, how did you become Steadfast Overland? And, and kind of tell us what you do, and then we'll kind of go even further back. Uh, to all you know the fun stuff getting involved with this and, and all the yeah. things between so steadfast well okay so steadfast originally was steadfast grooming and what that was was i got in trouble for uh buying too much beard product and my wife one father's day went mm. and bought me a bunch of stuff to make my own beard balm and beard oil that's where the All steadfast right. came from, but it kind of morphed into the cutting boards. And I did a lot of woodwork on the side. You know, I built furniture mm -hmm. for people and, you know, entertainment centers, dining room tables, you name it. And it's always kind of that weird, quirky, 
they have some vision in their head that, you know, they can't find the picture and I just go out in the garage with a pencil and a tape measure and make something work and they're happy. Um, so that's kind of how it, it, it started off with just the beard stuff, but now it's kind of gone into beard camping, cutting boards that I, that I've been doing. Um, you know, and I'm trying to do everything, you know, DIY. I'm trying to keep all of it as much as I can in house. Uh, cause my wife, mm -hmm. you know, she likes doing that stuff and I like doing it too. So, uh, the less paws that are on my product, the cheaper it is. But, you know, getting right. it done is the, the problem. Yeah. Well, for, I mean, you, you still, you still post heavily on, on Instagram and, uh, I, I like seeing like even some of the, the custom shelves and stuff that you've done or built for, for either yeah. yourself or somebody else. Like you, it's freaking phenomenal. It's like really fun. You know, it's, it's craftsmanship, you know, I, I yeah. would say that. And, you know, some, anybody can grab some two by four sticks and nail them together, or screw them together and slap some paint, you know, like the pallet tables, you know, Yo, it's yeah, like, yeah, hey, look, yeah. somebody made a pallet out of this coffee table. Yeah. It's like, okay. Yeah. So I, that whole phase, you know, it, it is what it is. But yeah. You're a little bit advanced from that. I have, uh, so yeah, that basically, so basically what I am is I'm a metal fabricator by trade. I've, you know, I never call myself a welder. Um, because there's guys that can just, you know, they can weld two you know, aluminum cans together in their sleep. That's not me. I'm mm -hmm. more of the, the fabricator end of it. You know, if it's, if it doesn't work or it's not fitting together, right. I'm the guy that comes in and, oh yeah, we can make that work, which that gets you in trouble a lot. You know, when you're working yeah. on these old third gen forerunners, <laughs> oh yeah, I can do that. No, yeah. you can't. <laughs> <laughs> but you know so then that's yeah. just kind of how the furniture and stuff came and um a lot of my furniture that i do is like metal framed uh metal uh steel or aluminum framed furniture then with some type of wood on top or you know however it is i've got like our our uh coffee right. i want it go ahead no, I was going to go ahead. Go ahead with you. Oh, like like my coffee table looks like a uh, that I built kind of looks like a modern day treasure chest. That's our coffee table. But it was just made out of steel. Nice. And just some scrap wood, basically. But it's just how you make it look. You know, it, that's the whole artistic yeah. thing to it that I never knew I had. But I guess I do. That's cool. So how long have you been dabbling in that? Like you're, you're good at fabrication and, and, and problem solving. And then you kind of, did, did your wife have anything to do with it? Were you building her some stuff? And you're like, uh, hey, this is pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Like so you yeah. Stumble everything, across you're it like gonna, that? everything you're going to learn about me was, I was prompted by my wife. Um, all my furniture stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it, it's kind of funny how it actually happened. So basically all my woodworking skills come from back when I was a kid, you know, riding BMX and building all my ramps. Uh, that's why I'm yeah. such a broken up old man. Um, I have a, a laundry list of broken bones and injuries that most people would look at and go, yeah, you shouldn't be walking. And I'm like, well, yeah, probably not. Oh, wow. But uh, um, so, yeah, anyway, one day she wanted a... Uh, um, a, uh, I guess you call it like a day bed to go out in the backyard by the fire pit. So I built like this right, yeah. day bed couch looking thing. And then after that, it was a dining room table for someone. And it just kind of went from there. You know, it was never, it was never really meant to be like a business business, but it's always nice to do it and have the cash in your pocket. You know, when you gotta go put a set of right. tires on something. Oh yeah, for sure. But, but you know, and then it's well, kind of just done everything. I, I was going to say earlier, it's not it's not rustic. I, I don't want to call it that. It's what what do you call it? Um, uh, like a warehouse kind of style. You know what I'm saying? Well, it's, it's, yeah, uh, it's, it's called wood in the metal. It's not rustic though. It's called industrial farmhouse. I hate giving right, it a title, but that's, that's what, what it's been called: industrial farmhouse. 
but cool man. You know, it, it it's got and that's the title somebody gave it, and that's what somebody said it was. So I guess that's what I'll go with. <laughs> so let's go even further back. How the heck did you get involved with camping and wheeling and exploring in a vehicle? Um, um you, you know, and, and I say this loosely because the term overland's kind of been a big thing the last few years. You know, but like, oh, yeah. I, I understand people grew up kind of went camping and stuff like, but like where did your focus start taking a turn, you know, and start, you know, your third gen forerunner building it out and, and um, doing all this fun stuff. So, you know, growing up as a kid, uh, my dad was a truck driver, so he was gone all the time. But when he was home, it yeah. was always, you know, Uber man time, you know, cause I was the uh, yeah. only boy and middle child. So, uh, he made sure that I did car stuff. So <laughs> nice. the uh, vehicle side of it came as it, you know, just came along with the territory. Like the, the very first vehicle I remember riding in was a 1951 Chevy business coupe that had been just completely chopped up and, you know, whatever all they did back, back in the late seventies, I guess it would have been. Uh, and I remember riding on the milk crate in the back seat. There was no back seat. Nice. It was just a milk crate. And, so that always, you know, I thought it was so cool that he could rev it up and it just blow flames out the, you know, the headers and, you know, so that's what, right. that's where the car thing happened. Um, you know, and then doing that as a kid working on them, uh, my first vehicle I had was a 1970 Chevy stepside truck that we had slapped a, uh, little, well, it was a built 350, a manual valve body turbo 400 transmission. So you had to shift it like a three speed, but with no clutch. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how I made my side money in, you know, high school, uh, illegal drag racing. Cool. You know, the good stuff that you don't tell your kids that you did. Yeah. Um, right. I did, yeah. You know, back road, two lane highway drag racing was so safe back then. But uh, mm -hmm. from there, you know, it was just uh, always had some type of car, uh, vehicle, hot rod of some sort, you know, Chevelle and uh, had a 70, 71 Camaro that I redid right before my oldest daughter was born. And then I kind of took a, I kind of quit doing it on my own because I worked for a guy and all I did was restore um, 67, 8, 9 Camaros. So I did that for a few years. Did you kind of get all the, the fi Firebird to Camaro conversions? No, <laughs> we were beyond jump on that. that bandwagon. No, we did not do that. We were, yeah, that was, <laughs> that's so not right. No, but, uh, it sucks, man. I passed a nice I, Firebird today, too. It had been a 68, 69. It was, I mean, it is, it is what it is, you know. It, it is like a first-gen Camaro, the, but. The funny thing is, is that all the. The the back then all the base Firebirds were way nicer than the Camaros ever thought about being. They had all the bells mm -hmm. and whistles and all the fancy stuff inside and all the you know better suspension and stuff. But as a Pontiac Firebird, nobody wanted them. Right. Um. <laughs> but you know, like the Camaro, that last Camaro I had, I basically got it, and it was. I mean, it was literally straight out of the Arkansas woods. I mean, somebody had just done nice. everything. Anything and everything you shouldn't have done to a Camaro had been done to it. And um, when I got it, it was gold with gold interior and a gold vinyl top. That's <laughs> what it looked like. It was awful. So mm -hmm. I, I redid it and it, I made it Cortez Silver with the Z28 stripes and it had nice. a big block 454 in it, which I was never allowed to start it up in the house because it knocked stuff off the walls. But, you know, nice. that's here nor there. But uh, but from there, um, from there on, you know, I, I just had stuff. I got out of cars, not really got out of cars, but um, kind of took a little hiatus on building anything because I was working so much on his stuff that he was selling. And... Uh, yeah, you know, having little kids and stuff like that, it's always kind of hard to 
you know, car seats going in old cars just don't, don't work. And, um, I think from there, um, I'm trying to think after that Camaro, uh, I did have a little, a little, uh, 94 S 10 with a 4.3 liter in it that I redid. And, uh, it was actually probably one of the fastest vehicles I've ever owned with a little V six in it. Nice. But, uh, it was, yeah. uh, there wasn't much S10 left of it, you know, but uh, when yeah, I got I, done with it. I remember it, a lot of those guys were taking those, uh, what was it, the 5.7 uh, LS1s and stuff, sticking them in those yeah. little square body S10s. Um, yeah. I, that that ended I just around did here the, really quick. <laughs> that little V6 that was in it was, uh, it was quick and I had done, this was, you know, this was before when you got like you programmed it you got that box that they would mail right. you get you order it and you had to oh it was a mess right. and i'd cut all the exhaust off of it and you know all the dumb stuff and ended up just getting rid of it sold it to some dude that was going to haul uh he was going to pull a trailer with it of some sort and i think he had it a week and crashed it out off a of highway 13 out the north yeah. side of springfield and i just i was kind of sick after that happened but uh mm. Yeah, so it, it so like fast forward into the, the off road stuff. I was never really into like off roading per se. Um, I did have a seventy eight Chevy short bed four wheel drive for a while, but you know it had the the mighty three hundred five in it, you know, and it was it was a dog. But um, I just uh, I worked with some guys that were big into Toyotas. And they were always, you know, building a rock crawlers and stuff. And they would, they always had, you know, old, old Chevy or old uh, Toyota trucks. And they'd have a forerunner every once in a while. But they were building like, you know, actual rock crawlers that were all like tube chassis, Toyota drivetrain. Um, and I, they had a third gen forerunner for a while. I was like, man, that's, that's actually a cool looking soccer mom rig, you know, and, um, yeah, I got, uh, got to talking to them about stuff. And this has been, this is probably, gosh, that's 12, 13 years ago. And I never did yeah. anything. I just kind of always had it in the back of my head. And then, you know, along comes Instagram and you run into people that you knew were acquaintances back in the day. And this guy that I knew was, uh, he was moving from Oklahoma to West Lafayette, Indiana. And he said, when he gets to Indiana, he's got to sell his forerunner. I was like, well, send me pictures. So he sends me pictures and it's basically the, what I'm driving now. Um, so I drove eight and a half hours to West, West Lafayette, basically sight unseen to pick this forerunner up. And I'm like, I told my dad, I said, hey, I need your help. We're going to drive to West Lafayette and pick this forerunner up. He goes, have you ever seen it? You ever drove it? I'm like, nope. <laughs> he goes, are we going to trailer it back? And I said, <laughs> nope. <laughs> We're driving her back. And then I showed him pictures. Nope. And he goes, drive it. you're driving that back? And I said, yep. So my first trip in that thing was eight and a half hours back from uh, West Lafayette. And uh, wow. it it did fine. I've done the only thing I've ever done to that thing, literally mechanic, you know, mechanical wise that's ever gone wrong with it since I've had it. And I've had it working on two years. Um, the, uh, throttle positioning valve was it. I've changed the really? oil in it. Basically maintenance wise, the thing I have literally got a book sitting over here to my left that everything that has been done since that, thing was bought is in this book and i've like gone through it mm. and wow you know i know you've been having so the previous trouble. owner had all that stuff the all the records well, and junk yeah so i'm the third owner of it or actually i'm the fourth owner of it all right um the first two guys that had it uh the first guy bought it and just drove it as a forerunner in 98 bought it in st louis and just drove it but he kept all the records and it's all just maintenance stuff. The second owner of it, that's when it got lifted and stuff. They started doing stuff to it. Um, but he has, I've got the receipts for all the skid plates that are on it. 
all that stuff is like the Savage brand, which I don't, they're, mm-hmm, they don't yeah. exist anymore. They don't even sell anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that stuff totally is like, buy one. it is stout. When you change the oil on that sucker, that skid yeah. plate, when it comes off, look out because it's going to get you. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's got skid plates from the radiator all the way back to the back bumper. Um, yeah. So the, the second owner started doing all that stuff to it. Then the guy that I bought it from, he basically just drove it. And then when things needed to be fixed, he just fixed them. So it's it's got... Like, I know like you were having trouble with your the wobble up front of some sort. And that one out there has got all new, yeah. like you said, all new rack and pinion stuff. Um, the only thing it really needs like right now to make it to where I would call it just good to go to whatever you want to do is I need to put new front coilovers on it. The ones that are on it are old. Um, they've been on there quite a while, but like all the back suspension on the thing is all brand new. Um, nice. but it's, uh, I mean, it'll do, it'll, it's, it's, it's set up pretty good. I mean, for 98 forerunner with, it's got, 270 yeah 270,000 miles on it right now but it's got your typical rust in the the all the uh rockers are ate up but i just put those covers on it and called yeah. it good because i just but you're, you know but your frame and everything on it is really good like a mac oh yeah it's, yeah say. the frame's and, good and yeah frame's good that's the that's the tough part on these like you got to throw the miles out the window yeah, on these older vehicles, but you've got a giant stack of service records, so you could totally throw the miles out even more than I can. Um, yeah, you know, as far as maintenance and all, that, people dig that stuff, and, and nowadays people don't even care to do an engine swap or a rebuild or anything. They just they know the dependability is there. So, oh yeah, you know if you're keeping up with road mileage, you know bushings and all that crap, then you'll yeah. be all right. <laughs> but it sounds like the second owner or third owner guy was just kind of like drive it until something went out. And then now you've yeah. got it. So you're, you're kind of fixing it where whatever you yeah. can fit. The only time I've ever had anything that kind of threw me for a loop on it was, um, I was driving it one time and I like backed up and like, you know, backed out of my driveway. And there's just like the little, you know, from concrete to asphalt. And I hear this thump and I was like, what yeah. the heck was that? So then I, you know, drive down the road, don't hear it. Then I hit another bump and I hear this, you know, thump. Like, and it's like, you feel the thump. And I'm like, are you kidding me? One of those brand right. new shocks is bad or something. I get back there. Everything's fine. And for like a month, I'm like, what the heck is this bump? And then I'm like, is the rear end going out? You know? And I was like, it doesn't feel like a rear end. Cause you can, mm. you've been around cars. You can, when you're driving, you can kind of tell where it's coming from um i couldn't figure it out Mm -hmm. and then one day i uh backed out of the driveway again and pulled right back in the driveway and it it bumped going out and it bumped coming in i'm like i know exactly what it is went back there to that back track bar and the bushings were gone just gone they're like barely hanging in there so i put new bushings in it man it's quiet now but old Mm -hmm. bushings will drive you nuts man that's it's crazy to me so like you know people always talk about pros and cons versus older um vehicle and newer vehicle you know obviously the 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 sticker price on a new vehicle is astronomical compared to an older vehicle so you could buy an old clean third gen high mileage clean third gen for less than probably seven grand um maybe less than eight with some miles on it but it's going to be rust free but there's going to yeah. be probably little to zero mods done to it. But by the time you go through doing your lift, bushings, all that stuff, you're still going to be in a really great vehicle for a third or, or probably a third oh, of, yeah. of, of a new vehicle price. Maybe, maybe a little bit less. But, I mean, you could build it out how you want versus yeah. the people going and buying a $60,000 brand new one and then having to drop another twenty, thirty grand on re-gear oh, that, lifts all the fun stuff racks all that crap. yeah it's that's not interchangeable i sat there um 
I had a guy come into that shop that I used to work at. Uh, he had bought one of the brand new, I guess it's 2024 Tundra, whatever. Yeah, it had been a 2024. Um, and they had that special yeah. edition that's called like a 1776 or something like that, some weird number or something. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. yeah. So he comes yeah. in, you know, that's a probably close to a $70,000 truck, maybe. Um, he wants to do a lift yeah. on it, but he doesn't want to do a real lift. He wants to put the, the uh, right. spacers in the front. And I, lit I literally talked him out of not doing it. I said, don't. I said, that, that is, you're doing yourself a disservice for this nice vehicle, and you want to put that in there. You're going to hate it. Crazy. And he never came back, so I guess I ran him off, but I, I don't know. I was just I didn't want to tear into some dude's That's brand good, new truck. Though. I just told him, I said, you're not right. going to like it. And they're yeah. not, they're not, you're basically just taking the front suspension and smashing it down just to make it taller. You know what I mean? You're making your springs right. compressed. And a lot of people, so a lot of people out there don't know it's, it's, he's caught, it's a leveling puck or a leveling kit. If you Something, see it online, they're yeah. leveling kits. So usually, what a, a a one a one and three quarters is, is equivalent to like two inches or something crazy. But that's all something it's doing like that, is, yeah. is furthering compressing your spring. So it it takes the comfortability, the drivability, or comfort the comfort ride, and it literally compacts the springs to where there's no movement. So if you hit a rock or pothole or something, you feel in the whole front end. Um, yeah, they're, they're not good yeah, for the front end. A, a 1794 edition, 1794, yeah, whatever the heck yeah. that means, a Tundra. Yeah, I, it was, you know, and that was the thing is that, that when I was working on people's vehicles, you know, doing all, you know, lifts and stuff like that, uh, some of your, the, I don't know, a couple months ago on one of your podcasts, you were talking about all the stuff people want to do on their vehicles. I swear... I got into a couple of different vehicles that they had so many electronic devices on their dash. I couldn't figure out what the heck I was getting ready to do. It was like I sat down behind a video game mm. and I had no idea what was going on. And one of them was a Tacoma that was a, a I guess it was a five speed. Are they, are they five speeds or six speeds? Manual transmission on those. They're, the manuals are six. Okay, so six speed. I went, I couldn't get the thing to start. Could not figure out why this truck, the guy just got out. I could not figure out how to start the car. Then I looked down and I'm like, oh, it's a six speed. He had all this stuff all around. I don't even know how the dude was shifting the vehicle. He had oh, really? CBs and screens and everywhere. everything funny. everywhere. And I'm like, this is not safe to drive. <laughs> Brand new, brand new to, uh, yeah. brand new to come on that one. Wow. And I'm like, I asked him, I said, so what all is, what That's is crazy. all this stuff? And it was every, <laughs> I think one of them was even like his Kindle. I didn't get it. Uh, but yeah, I had, I'm writing I, down I, the quote, what, what is all this? And I'm going to make a t-shirt and I'll give you 1% royalty. Yeah, there <laughs> you go. That's this? perfect. Dude, you you would not even imagine some of the stuff that I saw and some of the stuff that people wanted me to do. And it's like, you don't even understand the science behind this to get this done. And it's like, <laughs> I, ha I had a kid one time bring a Tacoma in uh. that he had been crossing a creek somewhere. And they... Uh, his wife was with him and you would have had to meet the wife to understand this, how this story ended up. It was, it was great. Uh, so he brings to me the Tacoma <laughs> and the, the passenger side front bumper is just smashed. I mean, just factory bumper. It is just all that plastic is just okay. destroyed. And I said, what happened? It was, well, we were crossing the water and I bumped into something. So I put it in reverse and backed up. And they went forward again and thought I would just crawl over it. Well, he's hit a stump and he just mm. literally 
put the stump up through the front of his truck. So he brings me the truck. He's like, can you fix it? And I'm like, well, maybe, but you have to have a whole new front <laughs> bumper. I mean, it's like you've smashed everything. <laughs> and I get under there and I start looking and there's like tree bark and, and rocks and dirt <laughs> just smashed into the front of this thing. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. It, it was awful. It was just you'd had to seen it. And then so I can just there's... imagine. Well, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I could just imagine his wife. Like I said, you'd had to met his wife. And uh, I'm sure it didn't go well in the middle of that creek when that happened. Because sure. she was she was the boss. That's funny. So it, it, this were, this is just what's the new thing going around with Rhino USA? It's like Rhino USA recovery teams. Like each I have got no, one I've now. seen it. I don't, I don't know what that is. I have no idea. You've not I don't seen know. that? or you have? I, I've seen it, but I don't know. I'm not sure what it is. Okay. Are are you, you're not really on Facebook, are you? You're um, primarily so- Instagram. In mainly Instagram. I, I, I let my wife take care of the Facebook stuff, but I haven't really done anything with the steadfast overland on Facebook yet, but that's here soon. Well, as far as like, I'm on Facebook quite a bit more than Instagram, but these chapters are different chapters of Rhino USA recovery teams or whatever, whatever the heck they are, you know, uh, so anyway, um, a couple days ago, as yesterday, somebody was down in, in um, Glade Top. They hit a water hole and and they, you know, they hydro locked their engine, more or less. Oh, was that the so, was that the red you know, peop- the red Cherokee? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I saw and the picture. And then Ryan yeah. went down there and, and got him in the Tacoma. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like. There's two different types of people here. Obviously, that guy was out solo. What was that? A Monday afternoon, Sunday evening, something like Sunday that. Sunday evening, um, yeah. And uh, it's probably just him and his wife, him and his girlfriend, whoever, and they just like hit this giant water hole all by themselves. I'm sure they were going 30 miles an hour or whatever, you know, hitting it hard and all this stuff. But it's like I don't know what goes through some of these folks' minds, but I would love to be there when it happens. Because they're living life oh. to the absolute fullest. You know, I, I come up on these water crossings and little mud pits, and I try to avoid them like the plague. Dude, uh, my, which is my, me. Maybe my that's wife, as you get older, maybe. I don't know. I, I don't know, but I've like, you know, when I get home from work, sometimes I just sit down on the couch and veg out and watch overlanding videos and stuff. And my wife will sit down next to me and she goes, Yeah, we will never cross water that deep. And I'm like, Eh, I mean, yeah. it's really not that deep, but then, then I made the mistake and I, and I sent him a message, um, independence overland when he did the, the, yeah. uh, down in Arkansas and they crossed the, the yeah. river at night and it was over their hoods. She looked at me yeah. and she goes, no, he should yeah. be in trouble. She went into full on mom mode <laughs> in our living room through the TV. So I sent him a message and said, Hey, my wife uh, said you shouldn't have done that, and I was just like, "Oh, yeah." I'm like, "That that was too much water there. <laughs> that was sketchy." Yeah, especially at night, crossing at night like that. Oh, that's yeah. insane. Yeah, it is. It's water is uh, different. You know, with I was just gonna say, water is yeah, just it's a, different. It, it's different. It can than be scary. Or... Yeah. And, and and for sure, like, we went on our trip, what was it, the, the 10 rigs from six different states back in February. Yeah. And uh, Destin got high-centered on a boulder. And I don't know, I didn't know Destin from, from Adam, you know, on that trip. And yeah, I remember like seeing our first that. Day. He says it was our second day. I'm pretty sure it was our first day. And he was high centered on this. I was like, this this guy is gonna hydro lock his engine, and and we're gonna pretty much spend our whole weekend trying to do a recovery. And uh, yeah, but fortunate for him, it just got kicked out of um, uh, four wheel drive on his manual transfer case. So yeah, it was just kind of in neutral. 
But uh, he was very calm and collective about it. I always give him kudos for that because a lot of people, they panic. And, uh, oh, and that, yeah, that was worse, but he was he was really cool. But that wasn't shallow water either. That was that was enough water to make you pucker pretty it was quick. Moving. It, but wasn't yeah. that the same video yeah. that and that was above Baker, his door jams? Yeah, that was the same video that Baker. Yeah. Um, we had a whole. <laughs> I've seen I've watched the video I think twice just because it was funny, and then a couple. <laughs> It was yeah. last week, I think, I was cruising through on YouTube, and I watched, uh, uh, is it Diamond State Overland? Is that one of your buddies? Diamond State Off-Road. Taylor? Diamond State yeah, Off-Road. And uh, it was the video where um, uh, Jacob, Eagles Overlanding, where his battery went dead. It was that his, yeah, it was, it was yeah. that video. And you guys jumped it with with wires or coat hangers or whatever yeah. it was. I was yeah. like, there you go. Those I boys had, are uh, from Missouri I had and Arkansas. Bailing wire. I, had, I had the bailing wire, and I'm like, all right, let's – you hold negative. I'll hold ground just in case there's an arc or something stupid. And I told Jacob, I, I said, dude, you're cranking this sucker. I said, you keep an eye on me and Taylor. I said, one of us may have a reaction to this, <laughs> so – uh, but yeah, well, man, worked out beautiful. I, I don't know what gauge it, it was. It had to have been a pretty thick gauge wire, but trust me, I, I, you know, coming from a welding background, uh, when you shock yourself like that, um, you definitely know it. It's, a. Uh, I, I got shocked yeah, one sure. time by an MSD box on a street rod that my dad had and I was doing something that was running and I reached over and touched one of the wire, one of the spark plug wires or something coming off that box. And this is an old school hot rod. I mean, this is back when, you know, they, the MSD box mounted on the firewall. It shot flames out of the wall and hit my arm. And I thought, I literally thought I was going to die wow. right there on the spot. It hurt. That just dates me, though. Mm. That just shows how old I am. I like, I mean, speaking of that, though, like these old hot riders are kind of dead. I mean, that's, that, that's a, that's a thing of the past, you know, pulling motors from this car and, and oh, yeah. this from that car. Those are kind of dead um, to a point. Me and me and a good friend of mine, because uh, I'm in the car scene, too. I love it. You know, not just overlanding, uh, but a buddy of mine, he sold me a 70. Well, it's a 71 C30. It's a one ton, but it's got like yeah. a 68 front clip. Anyway, he sold it to me. He's like, it's a basket case. He says, supposedly the motor's good. His dad was an old school hot rodder where he. He was a big Chevy guy. He probably had 15 different Chevys out at his place. He's always working on it, but he passed away. And he's like, Benji, I've got to move some stuff. So I, kind of a buddy deal. I helped him out, clear it off his land, you know, his dad's place, and got this old basket case. Well, anyway, today I got it running. Clutch is good. It's a little four-speed truck. Uh, brakes are, are soft, but they're there. <laughs> and I was, like, tickled to death. I was like, heck, yeah, man, we got we got." everything we need right now the motor sounds great it probably needs a little time adjustment but nothing crazy but we always him him and i always talk about these old hot rodders and stuff he's like are, are those people gone and i'm like no it's just a different variation now um and you could take that not necessarily every overlander but you've got you know people rocking the 20 year old 25 30 year old 40 year old vehicles for this stuff oh yeah they're not running them bone stock. I mean, there's some there's some science in there too. But I I would like to consider those guys um, not necessarily like the old school hot riders we're thinking of, but they are tried and true. Yet you know, there's still car yeah. guys out there just in different forms. So so just for everybody yeah. out there, you know, that's it. That's the thing is that you know, there's different styles. Yeah, um, like me, if I was gonna do it. Um, if I was going to have another car to drive, it'd be, a, it'd be an old car of some sort, carburetor, headers, you know, that's it. No, mm -hmm. no fuel injection, no nothing. You know, I, that, that's just the way I grew up. And that's why I like that forerunner. I mean, it's got, you know, barely got a computer on it, you know, but I can go out there and work on that forerunner right. and, and, and relatively be able to do everything I need to do myself on it. Now, you know, my other vehicles that I have, you know, everybody else in my family has something brand new. I'm driving the 270,000 mm -hmm. mile, you know, 4Runner. 
I don't touch theirs. I, if if I can't, you know, I'll change right. the oil and that stuff. But anything past that, it's like you got to have a you got to know what you're doing. Otherwise, you're gonna make a mess. You know. Well, even on newer vehicles, you have to have a you know not a snap on computer, but you have to have some kind of programming. If you, even if you switch out a window switch or something yep. like, you've got to yep. tell the the vehicle, hey, this is normal. <laughs> you know, this switch is yep. is being used. And That's the thing just, too, is it? You know, it's crazy. Back to these guys, you know, buying, you know, and I don't, I don't care what people buy or what they want to spend on their vehicles, but you get these guys that buy these, you know, brand new trucks and they're taking them out through the woods and smashing them into stuff, and it's like the stinking windshield on one of those things. It's got like a heads-up display and automatic oh, windshield yeah. wipers and stuff. That's like a three thousand dollar windshield, and I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. That's just not my style at all. But, you know, I say that, and then I'd love yeah. to have, like, a newer newer Tacoma. Oh, you, you, you there? Yeah, I'm here. It's just my video. I don't know yep. what the heck's going on. You you blacked out on me. It's, so this is what I was talking to you about earlier. Um, yeah. My computer kind of hijacks... Uh, what we're doing so we're still recording you just not yeah to see we're right good now until i figure out what the heck's going on but, but yeah so let's shift gears again man yeah let's get out of this car thing let's get into what 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 do you have planned for the next year as far as steadfast as far as exploring or trips or anything like that um so basically steadfast over landings about a year behind um i had kind of had a okay. plan for myself that 2023 would be the year that I get this all up and rolling and going. Um, things just didn't quite work out that way. Job wise, things went crazy. Um, my wife got real sick at the beginning of the year. Um, and she was, she was down and out for about three months. So I kind of just had to put everything Jeez, on hold. Man. Yeah. I tell you what, it's, uh, if you ever hear someone saying they had shingles, um sit oh, there and listen yeah. to him she had uh oh, the man. she had the worst case luckily it never got on her face but this happened uh january 1st of this year and uh it was march the end of march before she was like she said she felt like 50 percent and you know here it is now november oh, and she's still dealing with like nerve damage stuff and and my wife's like a go-getter so it really that really just slowed things down but uh so just in the past couple months with steadfast i've really been starting to kind of push it a little bit more and um you know i've got some hats going right now um always got the cutting boards always got the beard bomb stuff i'm going to get some t-shirts up and going so with that being said, I've, I don't know. There's two ways steadfast is going to go. It's either going to end up being more along the lines of, you know, t-shirts and hats and, uh, small items, stuff like that. Or if I get nuts, I would like to try to open my own shop, you know, but that kind of scares me because the whole overlanding thing is kind of, so hit and miss right now you know it was, it was booming there for a while and now it's kind of you know slowed down a little bit All right. let's 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 talk about this there's two things i want to talk about and i want to be as as uh respectful as we can so you've been in the industry you've been at a shop we won't say yes. who the shop is do you want to touch on any of that any of the behind the scenes you don't have to name drop but kind of talk us about that You've seen a lot more in the industry than 90% of us have. So if you want to talk yeah. about that, that's fantastic. So, huh. yeah, so what, I mean, I kind of fell into that job by accident. I'd gone into that shop and they were, they were getting ready to move. Well, they'd bought another building. And basically I got hired on to remodel the other build, the new building and do all the custom work and stuff do all the installs shop manager you know sales just all of it and 
that just it was uh my first four months there i basically spent all my time fixing stuff that uh other people had screwed up so i basically was just fixing stuff that was not put on right like people had drilled holes all the way through the roof of a brand new forerunner into the headliner and the lady kept coming in like uh, my oh. car's full of water so you know Ooh. i got to tear that whole thing apart and fix it you know stuff like that um but with that that whole overland um I don't know, market, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that mm -hmm. shop, um, it did really well at first. And it was just mismanaged money and all types of stuff. And it just, uh, I just happened to fall right in the middle of it when it all kind of exploded. But they're still going. Um, but, you know, I don't know how, what, what you really want to know. I mean, I could tell you all the gory details or, uh, all well, the anything that stuff. you wanted to touch on, I, I understand. Well, I, mean, I think most of us know who you're talking about, but if there was any insight to any, not necessarily the bad things, but anything that if you're going to take your rig to a shop, what to expect, what to assume, how things are supposed to flow. Um, if you purchase something online, are you supposed to get like a follow up email or, or you know, something, yeah, something yeah. for people to safely navigate around other stores? Yes, um, definitely. If you like order from any any shop, you know, if you order through their shop, make sure you get tracking numbers and make sure everything's gone through, because that was the thing is that they they were basically um, the website would say stuff was in stock, good and well being known to everyone that it didn't even exist, and. So people would pay for this stuff and they were just out their money for months on end and, you know, no tracking orders. Nobody would return. E it was just whatever people have heard on the Internet or rumor stuff. I would say 99 percent of it's true. Um, you know, if yeah. that gets me in trouble, big deal. But, uh, you know, but like if you I go to a shop. I don't think it could. Nah. Yeah. They, they've they've blocked me from every type of uh, um, social media platform that they have. Um, I asked them to quit using my uh, face and my my face on any uh, pictures or videos that they put up, and they instantly blocked me. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, if you take your stuff to a shop and they start kind of. Uh, giving you the runaround a little bit about something, don't be afraid to just say, okay, fine, I'll just take it elsewhere. Because uh, it's not rocket science, and if they try to really... I, I don't know. They Some guys should not be working on vehicles at all, period. And you can make a mess out of the top of somebody's vehicle by putting a roof rack on it. They're not just, you know, take six bolts out right. and put six bolts back in. Um, some of those, like... Uh, some of those, it's like Silverados, a lot of trucks, the regular, regular trucks. If you put a roof rack on them and they're able to take a roof rack, that's hardened steel in the, the roof. Well, guys will go in there and mm -hmm. try to drill through that hardened steel with regular drill bits and end up, you know, tearing stuff up. You got to have the, the equipment to do it. Um, some of those, like when you put roof racks on, some of the bolts you take out and then you have to put in, um, oh, what the heck are they called? The, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank on what the, the bolts are that you, rib nuts. You have to replace, yeah. put those rib nuts in there and you have to drill out that hole, make it bigger. Well, guys would drill like, Make the yeah. hole bigger and like keep drilling and go through, and then people are complaining about water in their cars. You know, it, it can it can turn into a nightmare. I've done, gosh, I don't, I don't know. It's you got to just. I just tell people to watch out when they have people start really messing with their vehicles, and and be if you can be out there and watch them, 
be out there and watch them because yeah. you know if they don't put so what would you say to a it, shop that what would you say to a shop that's like no you just got to drop it off and and you you can't watch us you can't w- would that be a red flag or would you be I, I would on definitely the reviews of the shop i guess depending on the reviews of the shop and if you don't if you don't know them that's a big red flag um i know a lot of shops don't yeah. want you you know out in the shop but in that that's fine but when you're putting sure, at least to, to inspect on, it here and there yeah mm-hmm. but when you're doing aftermarket stuff like that you kind of i mean i i don't know it it's really hard for me to say because it's like I've done it for so long. I know the tricks and I know what I should do or what I shouldn't do. You know, if the if the directions right. say do this, but I know that if I do it this way, it's going to be better. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely do it a different way. But um, like uh, we'd have a lot of people want to come in. They want to put all this solar stuff on their cars. Solar panels here, yeah. solar panels there. And they and I and I would always tell people I don't recommend ever tapping into the main electrical harness of your car to do any of that stuff. And people want to run like extra batteries in the back, like another battery in the back of their truck and stuff like that, but have it running off of the battery and alternator up front. Well, you can do that, but Nothing in that vehicle is meant to run a second battery. Most alternators barely even run the car that you're driving, let alone trying to charge another battery in the back that you've got a solar panel hooked into also. I don't get some of that stuff. Right. But um, Right, through a really thin gauge wire or something stupid. Yeah, I we, we did a uh, Sprinter van that uh it had from from mercedes already had some solar stuff on it and they wanted all this other stuff run with solar and it was an insane nightmare and we ended up uh, having a guy come in and go through it and had to have him do it because i was like I, I i have no idea what i'm doing i i mean i can do parts of it but there's so many wiring harnesses on those things and it, it, they are scary, you know? So I just said, nah, not, it's not worth, uh, it, it was a hassle. It was scary. But, so let's shift know, it again before we're, we're yeah. getting, we're, we're getting close to an hour, but I don't want to keep cutting off on, on, this is some pretty good stuff. I want to talk what you touched on earlier about kind of the overland, how it was kind of at a peak and now it's kind of uncertain. I think it's pretty apparent to a lot of people that overlanding, and I know a lot of us hate the term overland, um, but I think, I think, I don't know. I'm on a different journey. We're all on different journeys. We're always constantly changing. We're getting better. We're getting worse, whatever. We're always as long as you're active within this hobby, you're going to progress or digress or be content yeah. or the other. But I feel like a lot of us that are into it, um, even if you're on social observing, you know, there's, there's definitely a different vibe. I hate to use that word, but there's definitely a different feel uh, <coughs> versus three or four years ago for sure. But I didn't, I didn't know if you wanted to spend just a little time in touching on that, if anything that you've seen or, or any predictions yeah. you have for this overlanding thing. So, yeah. So, you know, and you hate to even say it, but during the whole COVID thing, that's when it was just booming. You know, everybody thought it was just COVID was just going to wipe everything out. But that, you know, and everybody knows that it helped the camping industry out tremendously because that's about the only thing you can go do. And... <clears throat> So that being said, that shop that I was at, he was able to get a whole bunch of stuff shipped over here, you know, like Howling Moon stuff and um, 23-0, you know, stuff like that. And he was able to keep it going that way where other guys just didn't have the money, you know, to keep their shops going. He he was able to at the time. And, uh, you know, so he... 
that was where a lot of the that was the uptick of that place and the downfall of his, that shop was COVID. Made a ton of money, but it was not spent right and done right, and it ended up just, you know, making me a very angry person at certain people. But anyway, so uh, that all those tents and stuff coming in, you know, you were able to get like a, you know, a really awesome tent for like, you know, three grand. That that was like Taj Mahal of a tent. You know, now you look at tents and they're four, five, six thousand bucks. Who's got that kind of money to go spend on a tent that you may use five times? You know, if you're not going to do it every weekend. Yeah. You know, and it's it's you have people that are diehards that are going to stay in it. And then you have the flash in the pan people. And that's what that's I think that's what the industry is doing right now. You have your diehards and then you have your people like, oh, I want to do that. And then they go spend a weekend out in the woods when it's 100 degrees out, and they're like, I'll never do this again. You know, so that's kind of what scares me about it. It's just finding that – it's finding the companies – That was this is one thing that I learned. It's finding the companies that have quality stuff that aren't trying to just drag everybody over the coals with their price. I would see products come in, you know – who in their right mind would spend five hundred dollars for a three burner cook stove? Right. I, I, I just don't see why you need that. I have one. Yeah. Because I had to take it because I had to go shopping on the showroom floor because I was owed money. But anyway, uh, <laughs> in uh, I don't use it. I use my little Coleman because it's easier to use. <laughs> But there's just stuff that we would get in that just had these astronomical price tags on and you take it out of the box and it's complete and utter junk and people would buy it. And I'm like, you can go to Walmart and get something better for a quarter of the price, you know? And that was where I was like, if I do yeah. a shop, I'm going to find. If I, why like, why I do you think thinking, that is, though? I mean, do you do you feel like? I I don't know. I don't know. I I don't get, I don't know. I think I think people just like to spend money on crazy stuff. I think is the the actual gist of it. I mean, I I wouldn't spend seventy dollars on a coffee grinder, a hand turning, handheld coffee grinder. But, dude, that was one of yeah. our fastest selling things was a $70 coffee grinder. I, I don't yeah. I don't understand some of that stuff. But <laughs> so I was just yeah. I've always tried to figure out which companies had quality stuff. Um, but not at that, you know, top tier price. And it's, it's hard to do. All right. So. So there's a few there that always say uh, it's the overland tax, which I don't want to get into that. Um, but to a, to a point that I don't want to go down, you know, a lot of this stuff is, is very not mass produced in a way. Some of it's not. Um, yeah. So I can understand the overland tax. The second thing I look for in companies, not necessarily shops, but companies that are pushing the product or creating the product, is are they overlanders or camping people? Are they into the outdoor world? Are they giving back to that, you know, outdoor community? Or are they just doing it for a money grab? You know, like there's been a lot of pop-up uh, oh, businesses yeah. in the last four or five years just trying to get in on this overland, whatever you want to call it, craze. But I feel like we're kind of in a digression or we're about to see a recession in and the popularity of it, because we're in an economic crisis right now, it's it's not apparent to a lot right now, but it's going to be pretty ugly in my in my my personal guess, I guess. Yeah. But I feel like um, you know people aren't going to spend the astronomical money on stupid stuff, and some of this is stupid stuff. Um, oh yeah. And, and I, I I think I think a lot of people are going to start dropping out of this hobby like flies. You're going to see marketplace flooded with used gear. Um, and we'll see who sticks around. 
we'll see who's uh, yeah. who's the ones that are in it for the hobby or in it for the money or whatever. So it's it's an interesting. Yeah, time. I, I I bet you if you, if you went down through there and you could go and just say you know anybody's shop and go through their stuff that they have in stock, ninety percent of that stuff. Those companies have no idea. They just made something that everybody wants. They're they're not, you know, right. overlanding or camping or anything like that. And then and then you have the the good ones, you know, that are like um, Colorado four by four. I think all those guys, that company, they all are camp all the time. I just you know, if you look at their stuff, they're all they're always out doing something. Um, there was uh, another company, and I think they just do tents in uh, Intrepid. I think it's Intrepid Tents. Yeah, I've heard of them. They, yeah, yeah, they do some other little were, stuff, but yeah. Yeah, they they were, if I'm not mistaken, those guys that came up with Intrepid were a bunch of, like a couple engineers and a doctor or something, and they didn't like their clamshell tent. So they designed one of their own, and that's where that came from. So you know that that's a company that's that cool. those guys were into it. Uh, and then, right. like you know, Backwoods Adventure Mods, thick into it. You know, I've put more Backwoods bumpers on vehicles in Missouri. It, it's it's in I, they're all over the place. You know, and yeah. you know, I, I've got like uh, I was trying to think. Anyway, I lost my notes. I would wrote down some stuff on companies like that. It's funny that you asked that question because I wrote down companies on it, and I've got the wrong piece of paper. Of course, that's, that's just how my style is. I bring the wrong piece of paper to the sure. right meeting. But No, I'm the same way, yeah. bro. I like to take notes. But, yeah, I was going to um, – uh, I'm trying to think. I wrote – where the heck did that go? Anyway. I've got like <laughs> I brought the wrong piece of paper. I wrote down the stuff like the uh, YouTube channels that I like to watch. <laughs> I don't know why I wrote that down. That, nice. I grabbed the wrong one. But yeah, you know, our uh, when we first started this, you know, we had to do the the replay at the very beginning. Uh, Chris with Fast Rack. That that's one stand up yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. I I love Chris and he's and I always yeah. tell him. I'm the better looking younger, your better looking younger brother is what I tell him. And he just looks at me like, man, why you gotta be so mean? I'm like, well, I'm just talking the truth, you know, <laughs> but he's a good guy. That's right. Um, well, I, I, I'm in talks with him to get him on the show and I'd, I'd still like to go camping with you and him at the same time, if all possible. I mean, we're not too, too well, far away from each other, but, uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to make the the listener event for sure. Uh I'm going down I'm going down this Saturday to Backwoods to their little rigs and coffee. So I'll pro I think you were heading down there, there working. I'll be there. I think a kid that yep. a kid that I met, he's going to we're going to ride or drive down together. He's got a first gen forerunner. Sweet. That uh I don't think we're going to probably do more than 45 miles an hour all the way down there, but we're going to make it. But nice. um, I'll have to check to it out. It. What year is it? Do you know? Gosh, I have no idea. I late eighties. Solid, solid axle or not? Solid axle. Uh, two door. Is it really? I think so. Yeah. Not unless you. Swap it's one of the very it. first one. I don't remember what year it is. Man, I'm probably an eighty-five okay. then. I I love those first gens. They're just probably not for me for an overland buggy, but man, they're cool. If you wanted a simple, oh, he's got it rig. He's got it set out. up. It's he's got it set yeah, up pretty that'd cool. Be cool to see. Um, I'd like to see that. But yeah, I've got I've got some stuff I need to do to mine, but I've got I need to get a battery battery bank some sort you know blue eddy or something like that and get that all set up i just yeah i've been kind of slow on getting stuff for it because i'm kind of in the same boat you are that uh it's got enough miles on it i don't want to spend too much money on it in case something bad goes wrong you know so i'm kind of de debating you know what to do but um 
I don't know. It's just a, it's always a toss up. I see these to- these uh, Tacomas and Tundras running around. I'm like, I'd love to have one, yeah, but that price sick. tag is that yeah. price tag is. It's insane. I don't think I don't think my wife would like that price tag. <laughs> no, I don't like them. And then go out and, no. and scratch the crap out of them. Yeah. But that's just yeah, me, Glade man. Top. I, I, tell, I don't know. I I literally think some no. of the trails at Glade Top were never ever meant for a car to go down. And it's like you get in there and you get you're like if I need to turn around it's not happening you just gotta keep going it's not you can get to scrap the crap whatever scratch the crap out of your car there's a few clearings and stuff but you're not gonna get there without a scratch oh no but I tell well, people them, up front I'm just like it's fun but well some of them the stinking trees overhang so much if you with your tent on or your awning you're just you know. You're waiting mm-hmm. to just rip something off, but I don't yeah. know. That's it's it's what it is. If you're gonna, my dad always said, uh, if you're gonna play, you gotta pay. So <laughs> it's got to do right. it. That is right. But yeah, Works with anything, um, man, we're over an hour right now. Let's uh, let's let's wrap it up just a little bit. We've talked about okay. the diehards versus the wannabes. We've talked about everything in between, you know, looking out for shops and stuff, old school cars and fun stuff like that. But how could people follow you on Instagram? And uh, do you have a website or anything like that people can get um, hold of you? I do not have a website right now. That's all this stuff is kind of in the works. Um, you know, working a job where I'm working 40, 50 hours a week and then doing this on the side, some of that stuff, it just takes a little time. Uh People can find me on Instagram under the Steadfast Overland. That's the that's the Overland page, and then my personal page is Jarrett underscore Hudson, and it's just kind of a little bit of everything. It's got my furniture on it. It's got cars, family stuff, music. Everybody always kind of gives me a hard time with some of the videos I do. I put like you know some really heavy music. And I'm like, I'm not the your typical 49 year old dude. I still listen to, if it's not heavy, I don't listen to it. <laughs> it's like I'm sorry, you know. Uh-huh. You know, I right. I grew up listening to the Ramones, not you know Bon Jovi, you know. So that's kind of how nice. I grew up. So that's what that's what I tell people. I was that's cool, man. I was punk rock when punk rock was original. So that's how I go. That's right. Before it was cool, um, yeah. Sweet man. Well, well, dude, I I'm a, I appreciate you coming on the show. I know we could have talked a, a lot more, and and honestly, if we ever do a trip together in person, uh, yeah, we'll do a campfire discussion for sure. Because oh uh, yeah, I'll I'll let it, I'll let it know. all. I'm, I'm gonna try to hear what. Say it again. What? I'll, I'll let it all hang out there. I'll, I'll, I won't be as PC. I can. Uh, I, I'm the. I am the vet. If I had a a PhD in useless knowledge, I, I would. Dude. Yeah. I'm so full of useless knowledge. I can keep people laughing for hours. Yeah. And if there's any nice. adult beverages, that just helps out even more. That just helps. That just helps. Yeah. That's right. All right, brother. Well, I think we're gonna we're gonna hang up the hat here, guys. Appreciate you checking out the channel. Don't forget to check out the show notes below. Go check out Jared and all his endeavors, and uh, be on the lookout for uh, some content. Hopefully, we'll 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 get some more stuff with Jared here in the future. But until then, tune back in Monday. Be safe, each and every one of you. Bye bye. <laughs>